Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar, which today is Unlocking the Value of Your Data Lake, sponsored today by Ahana. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A section, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions by Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, the chat section defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to chat with everyone and network throughout the webinar. And to find the Q&A and the chat panels, you can click those icons in the bottom middle of your screen to activate those features. And just to note, and as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Dipti Bokar. Dipti is a co-founder and CPO of Ahana with over 15 years experience in distributed data and database technology, including relational, NoSQL, and federated systems. She is also the Presto Foundation Outreach Chairperson. Prior to Ahana, Dipti held VP roles at Alexio, Kinetica, and Couchbase. Dipti holds an MS in computer science from UC San Diego and an MBA from the Haas School of Business at UC Berkeley. And just to let everybody know, I've known Dipti, Dipti for some time now since she was at Couchbase. Always glad to have her speak with us. She's a great speaker. I'm very excited to see her channel her passions into her own company. Congratulations and hello and welcome. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, great to be here again. Um, we're uh, big fans of Dataversity and uh, it has such a great audience always. Looking forward to a lot of questions, interaction, um, and uh, good conversation about all things data. Should I go ahead and get started? Absolutely. All right. Uh, so thanks everyone for joining um, today's webinar on unlocking the value of your data lake. Um, Shannon kind of uh, gave a very uh, a generous background uh, of me, but uh, let me tell you a little bit more about uh, 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 my experiences on the data side. So I actually started off in uh, distributed DB2 uh, on the structured databases. Um, there was a core kernel developer in storage and indexing there. And I've transitioned myself in many different ways in the ways data platform teams transition themselves from structured to semi-structured data with, with Couchbase building SQL uh, on JSON, uh, and then move back to the analytical side uh, with this big uh, uh, disaggregated uh, system that we're seeing now, which is kind of the next wave of analytics that I'll talk about today, that's driving data lake adoption. Uh, and uh, I founded um, Ahana um, just as uh, the pandemic was getting started last year uh, to simplify SQL on data lakes, a SQL on S3, which is where we're seeing a lot of data moving towards. Uh, and so today I will talk about a little bit about data warehouses, uh, how data lakes could sit next to the data warehouse, how you could unify them, um, and uh, what are some of the disaggregated languages and uh, query engines like Presto and Spark and others. Um, and then uh, we'll follow up with a, a quick overview of Ahana, which brings open data lake analytics um, to data platform teams. Uh, so let's get going. So as most of you know, you know, traditional data warehouses are all about uh, structured data, RDBMSs. Uh, these typically have a star schema. Um, there are some specialized versions of this which have column stores um, and you can do quite advanced analytics on it, uh, multi-way joins uh, across uh, the, your fact and dimension tables, uh, but it's mostly structured data. It's very, very clean data. It's highly normalized, uh, modeled. Um, and typically you have an uh, ETL approach, which means from your operational data store, you extract that information, you extract rows, you transform it in an ETL tool, uh, uh, traditionally with like an Informatica or a Talent or others, and then you load it into your data warehouse. And that's typically a flow. Of course, you have a SQL access on the top, but over time, what has happened is we've seen uh, challenges. It gets extremely expensive because it's a, a fairly, it's a tightly coupled system with storage and compute together. And so it's quite expensive. Um, over time, it might become difficult to manage. Uh, it's uh, costly to maintain um, some of these data warehouses. And there's only so much data you could store. And that's how kind of Hadoop started off where uh, it got, the warehouses got quite uh, expensive and people were looking at alternatives to store a data for a longer period of time. 
uh, and you also have limited access from the kinds of processing that you can do. It's obviously structured access with SQL, but other workloads uh, like general purpose computational workloads are harder to run um, on the warehouse. And so there's this, this big modernization that we're seeing over the last, uh, I would say, um, two years, but really or even accelerated over the past 18 months. Um, digital transformation, everyone's obviously talking about it. That means a lot more data. There's a lot more real time, a lot more real time events in information that's coming in that needs to be streamed in. And that means uh, fast data or uh, the ability to the system needs to be able to handle a lot of uh, uh, fast data that's coming in and streams as opposed to batches. Uh, and there's a lot more modern techniques to process data. There's a AI, ML, uh, a general purpose computation with Spark, for example, and of course, SQL uh, uh, with uh, engines like uh, uh, Hive and Presto that have emerged. And so that, that is all about making your data more valuable for you and, and, and make it smarter for you. And so what we've seen is that the data warehouse or the, the database essentially is split apart, right? And so it is like, I call it the, the big deconstructed database because um, now you have a storage engine or storage layer that's separate. It, it ends up being the, the lake, which is S3 or HDFS. You have a, a query engine on the top. You have other components like the catalog is a separate system. Uh, even the transaction manager and the log manager is a separate system. And so uh, there is, is, it is now a kind of a disaggregated system uh, that uh, users and platform teams are figuring out how do we put this together and get value out of the data lake once uh, the data has landed in there. So let's, let's kind of take a look at uh, you know, what's happening there. So traditionally, you obviously have the data warehouse, you have uh, uh, your reporting dashboards running on top, uh, Tableau, Looker, many other, uh, anything that connects with JDBC, ODBC. Uh, but because of a lot more data being available, being generated, um, it's the people are looking at the data lake approach, right? We're seeing thousand X more data. How do you keep uh, that warehouse going? Um, you know, it's uh, funnily, uh, someone you were saying the other day, you know, it's called teradata, it's terabytes, right? And then you had exadata, but what about petabytes or, you know, hundreds of terabytes, right? It's uh, where does it go? Where does it live? Because data is extremely valuable and uh, you want to have access to it to be able to query it. In addition to that, because of the devices that are coming up, third party data, telemetry data, event data, there is a lot of different types of data, which is in some cases, it might mean JSON, uh, CSV, um, or optimized formats like ORC and Parquet. Uh, and so the system, the modern analytics system need to be able to handle um, this, this new kind of data as well. And then lastly, platform teams are looking for a lot more flexibility. Uh, you know, uh, there was a uh, 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 saying that, you know, software is eating the world. And what's happening now is open source uh, software is eating the world, where you have a lot more open source technologies that are coming out of internet giants like Facebook and Uber and others that give platform teams the flexibility of not being locked in, of using open formats, of using open clouds. And all of these things together are driving open data leak adoption um, with a lot more workloads that can be run uh, on the top. So you obviously have your reporting and dashboarding with uh, bring your own you know, BI tool, but you have data science, you have um, SQL notebooks, perhaps you have uh, uh, Python notebooks that might need um, machine learning workloads like TensorFlow. You might have in data lake transformation with uh, engines like uh, Spark and others. And so this is what open data lake analytics means is uh, open source, open formats, uh, open cloud and, and open interfaces like SQL, uh, which is uh, you know your traditional JDBC, ODBC. So um, you have your traditional data lake. Uh, you have a more traditional data lake, which is you know used to be Hadoop. Um, Hadoop was extremely complicated. Um, it was very much file system oriented. It was built for HDFS. Um, and uh, it was, you had to ingest into HDFS. There was uh, you know, discovery that was needed to be done. Um, uh, it was less expensive than the data warehouse, but still uh, a lot more governance was needed on top of it. And so both data warehouses and data lakes started to move to the cloud, right? Uh, and so um, what we're seeing a lot more of is that data is moving into the, the cloud data lake. You still have, in, in many cases, 
uh, you still have a data warehouse and then you have a data lake which augments your warehouse that sits next to it uh, that contains all the data so you might have 10 percent or you know 5 to 15 percent of your data in the warehouse this is for your um, near term or your really really low sla use cases and then the rest of it for um, uh, broader use cases, historical data analysis, ad hoc analysis um, is in the lake. And the query engine is now a separated query engine where you have um, Presto, which is uh, which came out of Facebook, I'll talk a little bit about it further, is uh, becoming the de facto query engine for the reporting and dashboarding use cases, as well as some of the SQL data science use cases. Uh, then you also have uh, engines um, uh, like uh, TensorFlow, PyTorch, and others that help with the data science use cases when you have machine learning involved uh, for feature development, uh, for example, and so on. And then your your um, your ELT, uh, your ETL, which is where you had transformed before in your load, is now changing increasingly to E. LT, which is load first and then transform. And so we're seeing a lot of use cases within data lake transformation uh, with engines like, um, uh, you know, on application uh, side is with Python or Airflow, but with engines like Spark. And so, so this is the new modern stack that we're starting to see quite a bit of. Um, this is what runs at Facebook, at Uber, at, at Twitter. In fact, they call Presto their open source data warehouse. Um, and uh, there's uh, thousands of servers running uh, of these um, uh, of Presto, for example, um, for all of these workloads that run on top of it. So now let's take a look at, uh, you know, step back up one level and see um, how does this fit into the bigger picture? Because, you know, you, you have your operational systems, you have your uh, stream systems, you have your ETL systems, and, and so on. So typically, you have your operational data sources are your you know, MySQL, Postgres, uh, including NoSQL, Mongo, Couchbase, and others. Um, this is where the business is running, right? The business is running on top of it. Um, you use typically data engineering pipelines, um, or you know, it could be streaming, it could be a, a, your more traditional ETL to store it into the warehouse. And then you had workloads on top, reporting, dashboarding, this kind of flipped uh, uh, horizontally uh, a little bit, uh, this chart. Uh, but what's happening is the storage is now going to the data lake, increasingly S3. Um, if you think about it, S3 has been around for 15 years. There are trillions of objects in, in S3. And, and just from a, you know, a revenue perspective, uh, AWS makes billions of dollars just on storage. And so the amount of compute that's needed on top of this is pretty significant. And that's where some of this new data comes in, streaming and IoT data, third-party data. And you have these workloads on top of it. You have obviously your SQL querying. That's where Presto is. That's where Ahana sits. You have a machine learning transformation. That's where Databricks and Cloudera are. And then you also have a smaller workload, which is coming up, which is data virtualization of federation uh, in, in situations where uh, you have data that's not landed in the data lake yet, or you might have uh, ephemeral data in another system and you want to correlate it with data in the lake. And so these are the, you know, the popular workloads that run on your lake. Obviously, the, uh, you have your consumption on the top where you have your reporting, your dashboarding and uh, other, uh, other workloads, uh, as I mentioned, uh, running on top of it. So this kind of completes the picture in, in, in terms of what the modern data warehouse would look like. Now, I talk to a lot of users and, and I broadly kind of classify them into two categories. Uh, you might be a platform team that is even uh, born in the cloud, right? But pre-warehouse, that means you might still be running Tableau or Looker and others on an Aurora or, or MySQL or a Postgres. And you're thinking about, you know, moving to a, a data warehouse or a data lake, right? Which one should you choose? And, um, and then there's the other category of folks who are already on a warehouse, but where the warehouse is starting to get very expensive and they're looking at an augmentation strategy, right? Um, and so for these two use cases, if you're in the former, um, I would say that, you know, it's very interesting that over the last couple of years, quite a bit has changed. And finally, users actually have an option for the first time in, 
in 20, 30, 40 years where they can try and skip the warehouse, right? Um, if the use case is simple, uh, if you have uh, simple joins, uh, you know, maybe simple star schema or even a denormalized schema where you have a single table that's very sparse, um, you could you could just run analytics on a data lake and it could be extremely affordable, very flexible, um, and uh, and that could work for you. Uh, but in some cases, you may not have the skills, right? And so in that case, starting off with a warehouse and then moving to a lake or augmenting it with a lake might be uh, the better approach. So, so I talked a lot about you know, the, the different workloads, why open data lakes um, uh, skip the warehouse strategy versus uh, augmentation strategy. And so for the rest of this presentation, I'll focus more on cloud data lakes. Now, cloud adoption, S3 adoption, GCS adoption, all of these object stores, right? Uh, that's where um, the data is kind of landing first, even before hitting a warehouse. These are driving the adoption of these open source SQL query engines. Here's a chart from um, the uh, DB engines, right? So DB engines is a pretty well-known ranking for um, a variety of systems, databases, relational databases. Now these engines are actually not databases because they don't actually manage data. They're just the query engine. But even then, uh, you know, they're kind of included in there, they're SQL. Uh, but you see that, you know, the, the, the growth. So Facebook uh, created Presto 20, 2013, 2014. You see the growth of it. And the, especially over the last two years, um, you know, over will will kind of overtake Spark. Spark is kind of more general purpose query engine. You can do a lot of things with it, but uh, but uh, it's you know Presto is starting to really um, catch up there and uh, it's growing very fast. And then you also see Apache Drill, which which was a precursor to to Presto, uh, came out of um, uh, uh, was based on Dremel, the Dremel paper that Google published, um, and um, uh, and is also kind of a federated engine, which means you can it can query data lakes as well as as data databases. But it, it kind of stayed flat, and um, uh, and and Presto is really has kind of risen um, across, uh, and so. Um, Hive, I should have uh, probably included Hive as well. Uh, Hive came out of the Hadoop ecosystem. It's largely used on-prem, but no, and not as much in the cloud. In the cloud, uh, we see uh, uh, Presto, which was about it's about 15 times faster than Hive, um, and built for interactive querying, uh, ended up being the the kind of a winner in for cloud from a cloud data lake uh, perspective and a query engine perspective. So. Um, so these are the, some of the considerations that you, you can think about uh, as, you, uh, as you look at data lakes. Now, there are a lot of similarities between you know, modern data warehouse, which is you know, cloud data warehouse, Snowflake, Redshift, and others, and modern data lakes. Um, in general, they tend to be cloud first, um, managed services. Um, they are in largely in memory. Um, both support um, uh, kind of complex data types. Uh, data warehouses tend to be better with uh, columnar data sources columnar formats, but CSV, JSON, others are supported as well. Um, data, data lakes tend to be better for this separated storage and compute. That is what they were built for. Um, the warehouse can support it, but it's not what it was built for. It's built for tightly coupled system and uh, highly ingest, you know, where you have to ingest into the system, right? Versus an in-place, an in-place approach for, for the data lake. Um, and so uh, there are a lot of similarities, but as you look at um, these, the workloads, you might want to combine them. You might want to look at combining them and merging them uh, into one with a dis distributed query engine, uh, like the ones we talked about. So there's th th six considerations that I would, um, um, you know, I would suggest SQL access. What kind of SQL access uh, are you looking for? What kind of clauses, sub clauses, features are you looking for? Um, uh, does does the query engine support that? Now Presto is uh, we're working on Presto, um, uh, and and it's the innovation on it continues. Where not only are we supporting data warehouse uh, uh, use cases, but are going even further beyond that, and so. Over time, the data lake uh, is where a lot more of the innovation will happen. Uh, some of the state of our database um, capabilities will also be merged in. Um, and over the next three to five years uh, can handle, would handle very, very complex uh, data warehouse workloads. Uh, today it supports uh, the, the simple to medium uh, complexity workloads. Um, and over time, it'll, it'll get even, uh, even um, uh, more um, wider. 
So you can unify both these um, in using storage as S3 or GCS and run the SQL engine on top. Um, you have distributed query engines like Presto that allow for you to query across different systems. So if you have data in the lake, you can query that. If you have data in Redshift, you can query that with Presto and you can actually perform a join across the two as well. Um, limitless scale with a data lake, uh, you really, I mean, the cost profiles are much, much lower than a data warehouse because your, your storage is very, very cheap. S3 is ubiquitous and it's cheap um, and you can build on top of that uh, and you can support um, um, many different types of uh, uh, data. So let's take a look at some of the use cases um, that, uh, that we see on the data lake. Any questions, uh, Shannon? Let me pause there and see uh, if there's uh, uh, any th thoughts, comments, questions. Uh, there was a comment um, uh, earlier, traditional warehouse store history like SD SCD type two. So using the lake, would you recommend storing historical data? Won't that make it processing more difficult? Um, so uh, if I understand correctly, I think the question is about maybe a uh, version data or um, uh, you know, time travel perhaps for traditional uh, warehouses. Um, the uh, there are many different features on on traditional warehouses, right? So um, they've been around for a long time, and you can uh, you could uh, some of some of them, not all of them. Some of them uh, support versioning uh, of schemas and versioning of um, uh, of the data itself. So you could go back in time, business time, and system time. Now, data lakes up to today, um, I would say um, even up to the last, in the last, uh, before two years ago, couldn't support it. But now uh, there is a new layer that's actually emerging and, and I'll talk about the lake house where you have the transaction manager, which uh, it traditionally is the log manager in the, in, in, within a database uh, that, is, uh, that is coming up. And there are th two or three popular ones that are out there. Uh, they're called table formats, incorrectly named. And again, um, you know, naming is hard for, and it's and it's confusing when it's not not named right. Um, but these, uh, you can think of them as transaction managers. With the uh, with the um, innovation of the transaction managers for the lake, what's happening is there's a new layer that's come that sort of sits on top of S3, and it allows for versioning of both the schema as well as the data. And so with this now, you can actually go back in time, you can do time travel, you can, um, you can actually uh, support uh, um, version schemas um, and so on. So I think that was the question. If not, uh, feel free to um, uh, you know, uh, correct me and I'm, I can uh, try to answer, <laughs> try to answer the, the question that was intended. So let's take a look at the use cases. Um, uh, Presto as an example for a distributed query engine was built for interactive query use cases. So um, think reporting and dashboarding. So this is your uh, Tableau, um, uh, Looker, QuickSight, um, uh, Superset is an uh, open source uh, open source one that we, we really like as well. And, um, and that's kind of what the first use case was. So reporting and dashboarding, SQL data science are kind of bread and butter use cases, if you will, for, uh, for Presto. Uh, federation is another great use case where you can query across databases and data lakes. Um, and in, in some cases where you have, um, depending on the customer facing apps, if you have the need to do a large scale, massive scale uh, ad hoc querying, um, uh, it might also be a very good uh, back-end engine for customer-facing applications. A good example here is a security, a cyber security, where uh, we, uh, threat hunting, for example, you might, if you have needle in a haystack kind of queries where you have to query, you know, what has happened for this IP address across all the millions of events that have been tracked, right? And in those cases, uh, a simple warehouse or a simple um, relational database, operational database is not going to be able to solve that problem for the customer facing application. And so we're starting to see some of these uh, come up quite a bit as well. The emerging use cases are uh, the lake house that I mentioned, I'll talk about it in the next slide, uh, as well as a lot more of the transformation using SQL uh, that's coming up. So Facebook recently uh, added built uh, 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 support for Presto on top of Spark. 
And so now you can actually have one single uh, layer of SQL on the top, which is ANSI SQL. Presto is a really great ANSI SQL engine. Spark SQL has some peculiarities about its SQL. And so now you can use Presto to run Presto or Presto to run Spark. And we're starting to see a, a lot, lot more Uber just recently uh, transitioned um, its transformation workloads to, uh, to Presto on Spark and there's others as well. Uh, and so these are, these are the, the emerging ones uh, that I'm seeing as we talk with users, the community um, and customers. So let's take a look at a little bit of a deeper dive on one of them, which is the data lake house use case. Uh, this is what the lake house use case, the stack looks like, right? So you have your BI tool or notebooks on the top. Uh, you know, you, there's many different that are supported. You have your JDBC, ODBC driver. Uh, these then connect to the Presto cluster. The Presto cluster needs a catalog. The catalog is not a part of the query engine. And there are two popular catalogs today that exist. One it came out of the Hadoop ecosystem, which is called the Hive Metastore. The Hive Metastore is not the Hive query engine. Uh, note, note that so there's confusion that's out there because they're both called Hive, but they're very different. One is a query engine and one is an actual catalog. So it's, a, it's an operational catalog. Um, this is what, what does an operational catalog mean? It means that it stores schema uh, for the lake and it is the mapping uh, for the query engine uh, to, the, to the objects that are stored in the lake. So um, what, what tables, what schemas exist, what tables exist in these objects and files? Uh, what are the columns in these tables? All of this information is stored in the Metastore or the catalog, the operational catalog. And the Hive Meta Metastore HMS is a very popular one. If you're on the AWS land, Glue is the catalog. By default, everybody uses Glue. It is compatible with HMS uh, from a, a wire protocol perspective, and it uh, connects uh, seamlessly with Presto. Um, for Ahana, we actually uh, have a managed Hive Metastore. So with every cluster, you can actually just check a button, and, um, uh, and, and, and it will be created for you and managed for you. Underneath this is the transaction managers that I was talking about. There are a few popular ones that have emerged. Apache Hoodie is one that it came out of Uber and uh, 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 Presto uh, uh, Hoodie and uh, Object Store is the stack that's running at Uber. Uh, Delta Lake is another popular one that is uh, was created by Databricks uh, for uh, for the Spark ecosystem, uh, and um, and that works with uh, with Presto and, and Spark as well. Um, Hoodie it uh, tends to be a lot more engine agnostic, and so it works with Spark, Flink, Presto. Um, Delta is a very good engine, um, uh, very good format uh, that Databricks is investing in, um, and it works well with uh, very well with Spark and uh, has good integration with Presto uh, as well. And then AWS is coming up with its own. Uh, it also supports Hoodie, uh, but is looking at building its own transaction transaction layer as well. And then the layer at the bottom is the storage engine, and the storage engine is the lake, which is where your objects sit. These could be Parquet files, ORC files, and others. Um, that uh, uh, that the meta store that I was talking about maps down to these objects. And so then the query engine knows where the tables live, the tables, uh, what do the columns look like and what uh, files and folders uh, do they point to right in the object store. Now, reminder that these uh, catalogs that I'm talking about are quite different from other catalogs that you use for governance purposes, uh, like, uh, uh, you know, popular ones, Colibra or Alation or, or others. Amazon uh, is another one, Data Hub, a couple of open source ones that are coming out as well. These are quite different. Uh, I call them the human catalogs. They are for human consumption. And the uh, HMS and Glue are for system consumption. So they're more operational um, catalogs. I see a, a couple of questions coming in, so let's uh, uh, let's uh, just take a look at this. Um, uh, does Presto support XML? We have SaaS vendors only uh, supports web services. So um, the way that, um, uh, from what I know, XML is not supported for Presto, uh, and so you would need a transformation from XML to JSON typically um, uh, uh, in uh, for for any of these for any of these languages. Uh, most times what we see is Spark is used for transformation. It'll, it'll do uh, XML to Parquet, right? XML to Parquet or, or ORC uh, transformation and then run Presto on the top. Uh, and here's why. Um, 
when you want uh, performance, better performance, um, the, the columnar data formats like uh, Apache Parquet and Apache uh, ORC are going to give you the best performance. And the reason is that it, it actually stores metadata, some metadata for the data within the file itself. And so you can actually skip parts of the file as you're scanning through this. And this becomes very, very helpful when you're doing large table scans uh, across the lake. And so our recommendation from a performance perspective, uh, it typically ends up being, um, you know, have your uh, store your XML, transform it to Parquet or ORC, um, and um, uh, and and run Presto on top of it. Now JSON is supported. There's a lot of good, uh, uh, un, you know, support for nested structures and so on. But you would see a performance hit, right? Because uh, it is not going to be as performant as some of the columnar uh, formats. Depending on what your use case is, uh, you can decide you want to keep it in JSON, you want to keep it in CSV, uh, or you want to move to a more performant uh, storage. Um, uh, very interesting. Uh, uh, love more information. We'll 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 send out some uh, some more um, information um, at the end. Um, let's take one more question and then uh, we'll keep going. Um, let's see here. Uh, can you? Yeah. Go, go ahead. Go ahead, uh, Shannon. I think I know which one you were were <laughs> right. diving into there. Uh, the. Uh, um, can you access and query on there you um, go. Yes. Yeah, Premier database and on cloud database and S3 at the same time? Mm -hmm. Currently, Athena cannot query certain types of database like SQL Server. Yes, so good question. So um, uh, with Presto, yes, you can query uh, 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 different databases. There is a general purpose JDBC driver that can be used for any database. Um, there are other drivers that exist, for example, with Redshift, with MySQL, with Postgres. Um, Kafka, there are 30 connectors uh, that Presto has. Uh, for Ahana specifically, it is built for the cloud. And so it is built for um, accessing S3 and a range of other uh, on cloud systems um, and does a much uh, provides much more federated access than Athena does. Um, for example, uh, is better uh, with uh, Redshift, with uh, RDS, uh, with Elastic um, uh, and others. And uh, because it, it provides native access versus Athena that provides la a Lambda, a Lambda based access, which can be pretty complicated. All right, Shannon, should we keep going? Um, take questions at the end, what would you suggest? Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, lots of questions coming in, but yeah, <laughs> even at the end, it'll be perfect. All right, so let's keep going. Um, next, I wanna talk about um, considerations for open analytics uh, as you think about this. There are six, uh, sorry, six, there are eight areas. Um, I'll walk through them really quick today and uh, you know, feel free to reach out. Uh, can, each one of these could be an hour long session um, as, uh, uh, as you think about the consideration for, for open analytics. Data, uh, there's a lot of different kinds of data. With, um, with data lakes, uh, what we're seeing is uh, it's really good for structured uh, and semi-structured data, complex data, semi-structured data. Uh, it can be text, pre pre Presto can query text as well, as well as streaming. So it, uh, you, know, you can have Kafka streams that drop data in. You can actually use Presto to query Kafka topics. This is something that Twitter does. Twitter actually has its literal Twitter fire hose that goes into Kafka streams and then lands into um, their uh, cloud store. So they are on GCS and in GCS uh, as well as on-prem. Uh, but uh, uh, let's say, uh, let's talk about GCS. It lands in GCS. Uh, Presto can query both GCS as well as the Kafka streams. And so with a data lake, you get a lot more flexibility over a warehouse. Now, uh, the other thing is that not, you, you can obviously run, you need a SQL workload, which will tend to be Presto, but you can run other workloads on that same data without moving it around, without ingesting it into yet another place and uh, run machine learning workloads, for example, with PyTorch or Spark, general purpose Spark workloads for in data lake transformation. And so uh, you have the ability to handle a lot more kinds of data uh, with, with, a, with a lake. Uh, analytics, what are the different kind of analytics that you could run? Uh, 
Uh, so obviously we talked about SQL. Uh, SQL, it uh, Presto is ANSI SQL uh, compliant. Uh, you get uh, the best of all of that. You get extensions uh, for the semi-structured data as well. You can run your Python workload. So we see uh, quite often just Python code, right? Just straight up Python code running, um, connecting via JDBC uh, to uh, do either transformation, simple transformation. Sometimes it's insert, sometimes it's, you know, uh, create table as statements where you are creating a um, copy of a table or a uh, or a derived table, right, in Python, uh, and then uh, running queries on top of that. So it could, that could be the workload. Uh, notebooks, Jupyter uh, tends to be very popular. Uh, Zeppelin as well uh, comes up every now and then. Uh, and then you have search. So um, a SQL obviously has a like laws and, um, you know, others. Um, you can, with Presto, you can also query across um, Elasticsearch, for example, and uh, query S3 and, uh, uh, and, um, uh, and search. Uh, who are the end users? Who is actually using the system? Now, data platform teams uh, or data platform engineers tend to be actually running the platform, right? And then on top of the platform, you may have data analysts, data scientists, data engineers, and the business. Data engineers will typically run the transformation workloads or data pipelines with Presto or Spark on the lake. Data analysts will typically use Tableau, Looker, Superset, and others uh, on, uh, on top of the lake, right? Scientists will typically use notebooks that run on top of the lake with Presto. And then business users uh, will use the dashboards that an analyst would create uh, and get a view of the business. So, so really what we're seeing is that lake consumption is across the board. As an example, Uber runs Presto uh, with hoodie um, on-prem. Half of the company hits Presto every month, right? That is how data-driven uh, the company is. And these are product managers, marketing, every department, um, even beyond the ones that I've listed here. And so um, with a vision of being truly data-driven, um, a, a unified and open data lake can really get you uh, to, that, to that point. Uh, the next one is uh, the platform itself. So think about, you know, where do you want to run it? Um, increasingly, I'm biased to the cloud. <laughs> so we, we are focused, Ahana is only doing cloud, right? Because it's very hard to build a product for, uh, for both on-prem and the cloud. When you have a cloud product like a Snowflake, it's really native to the cloud. It's used, built using best of breed technologies, runs on Kubernetes, highly containerized, highly available, flexible. So think about where you want to run it. If you are looking for an on-prem option, then an open source uh, you know, option, uh, do it yourself might be a good option for you if you have a strong data platform team, or you can work with other vendors, get support um, for those open source products. Uh, and and uh, the communities will help as well. Um, Ahana is the Presto company. I engage very closely with a lot of community users uh, and uh, um, uh, guide them in terms of their on-prem usage and, and, and how to uh, solution their system uh, on-prem. Cost can be uh, obviously a very big factor. Data warehouses can be very expensive, very fast. You're storing your data in two different places. You're storing your data in the warehouse as well as typically in S3. With a lake, you have usually one copy of it. You might have some derived data or you might have some temporary data that data scientists are creating, but that is part of the workload itself. And so think about costs um, uh, as you think about your platform uh, as well. Um, cloud, and we kind of talked about it already, right? Gives you tremendous flexibility, elasticity, um, you know, mobility and the global reach. You don't have to manage data centers everywhere. Of course, there is, uh, there are, uh, there's GDPR. You, you know, you, you need um, to maintain your data in certain places. With the HANA, the way I've uh, architected our product is we bring compute and presto to you and your VPC. So you have a separate HANA console, but anything that touches data, which is presto and, and other things, are in your environment. And that is the new modern approach. It's called NVPC deployment. Uh, look for that, uh, that kind kind of a um, architecture uh, and it will it, it will uh, allow you to have more control over your data by providing some privileges to the external entity uh, to just run run the system uh, and manage manage the system uh, security privacy or governance all of these are evolving uh, with presto uh, uh, ahana um, uh, created a uh, plugin for Ranger. So Ranger, for example, is one of the very popular uh, uh, 
authorization engines, uh, if you will, tools that uh, allow for our back like you would do in a database. And, uh, and it can connect to many different systems. And so now what we're seeing with uh, governance and, and, and security is more unified access um, across the board. Uh, and um, uh, Lake Formation is another one there. If you're running on, on that, uh, it provides uh, our back. Uh, and so Presto, for example, or you know, Ahana uh, integrates with some of these uh, different, different systems so that you can manage governance outside of the database or outside of the lake uh, and have more control over it. Um, the business, what does the business need? Uh, the insights from the data, the value of the decisions that are made from the data, that is what is important. And with Hadoop and with some of the complexities of it, it took nine months, uh, 18 months to actually see real value from these systems itself. With Ahana, um, as an example, Presto is way more simpler than Hadoop, right? And Ahana even simplifies it even more. Um, we do in 30 minutes, you need to be up and running with Presto querying your own lake in your environment. Um, and that's, that's how easy it is. You need to get value of your data in weeks and not years, right? And so we need to move to a model where the value of these systems, they're actually adding value versus data platform teams spending time on just operationally managing them. The op operational e uh, complexities have now all been removed. And so you have the ability now to truly see value of your data. And then finally, costs. So think about costs. AWS can get very expensive very fast. It's flexible, but it also can get expensive. Um, we just rolled out a feature in Ahana called uh, idle uh, 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 state management. So if the cluster isn't doing anything, it shrinks down to a node. Uh, and so look for these kind of capabilities as you um, as you pick your platforms, so you can make sure that your cost management is part of the platform and is part of uh, your your decisioning. So building a lake on your own with all of these open source tools can be quite challenging, right? So the do-it-yourself approach, you need a very, very skilled data platform team. Uh, Uber, Facebook, they have PhDs that, that handle this for them. They actually write code for the engine, right? Fix bugs. Uh, but Presto can be quite complicated. In addition, your op alternatives or your options um, uh, won't scale as much uh, from a computer engine cost perspective. Um, Athena is a serverless approach. It's very simple. It's really, really easy. It's a Lambda function for a SQL query, right? It doesn't get any simpler than that. However, uh, you can't really, you know, creating a Lambda function on a SQL, on a database uh, is, is non-trivial, right? And so there's a lot of limitations that come with it. Uh, number of uh, queries that can be run concurrently, uh, que queuing up of uh, the queries. We see that a lot. Uh, expensive, it's you ch you're charged $5 per for scan per query, and it can get you know expensive pretty fast. And so that's that's kind of where Presto and Ahana comes in. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the community. Would love for everyone to participate in the community um, and uh, uh, and um, perhaps uh, try out Ahana as well. So Presto is a distributed engine. It has a coordinator worker architecture. Uh, you have uh, you know these are uh, the clients on the top. You can see data analyst using the BI tool hits the coordinator. The work gets spread across all the workers, and then you can connect to all the data sources uh, underneath it. Uh, it was created at Facebook. It's hosted under the Linux Foundation, and so um, it is a sister foundation to CNCF and Kubernetes. This is very important. There's a lot of open source projects out there that are company driven, right? And so they're neither Apache nor Linux Foundation, but a community driven project, you get benefits from all the innovation that's going in. Uh, Presto Foundation has uh, 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 Uber, Twitter, Alibaba, uh, Ahana. I was a very early member of the foundation driving, driving the community and um, uh, as well as Intel and NHP have also joined the foundation. Lots of big users for Presto. These are all users, Athena users, Ahana users, uh, open source Presto users, a lot of great adoption uh, of Presto itself. And so with Ahana, it's very easy to get started. It's a, it's a managed service. So you sign up for, uh, for, the, for the cloud. Uh, you, we, we create a compute plane uh, in your account. So we use the AWS best practice of uh, cross-account access with a trust relationship. This is a one-time 20, 30 minute 
uh, process, which is fully automated, creates a VPC, it creates EKS clusters, everything from endpoint management on the network to the operating system underneath is, is handled. And then you have a single pane of glass that you can use to create uh, any number of Presto clusters for different use cases, workloads, uh, et cetera. Uh, as I was mentioning earlier, we've split the, the responsibilities. There's a very clear separation. Uh, HANA console is responsible for the orchestration, right? Auto scaling, um, change my num uh, resto nodes from five nodes to 10 nodes, right? Logging, uh, security and access and billing. And then everything that touches data is actually in your environment. And this is called the NVPC deployment, um, including um, we use Superset as an admin, admin uh, uh, SQL editor. That's also part of the, um, the, uh, the compute plane and then you can query across a range of different data sources. So this is what the stack looks like. Um, we allow for uh, a Hive Metastore, a managed Hive Metastore uh, that you can create just with the click of a button. Uh, in addition, uh, caching is built in, another click of a button and you have an entire uh, worker level cache that gets uh, added to every cluster uh, and uh, gives you benefits of not rereading data from, from S3 uh, every time you do a table scan uh, can improve performance depending uh, depending on the workload. Uh, you can also connect, it has a, a very native integration with Clue um, and, uh, and through that you can uh, VPC peer to any of your systems and uh, access data in place without any data movement uh, happening. And so that's, um, that's kind of an overview, a really quick overview uh, of uh, Ahana. Uh, and uh, a quick case study, I talked about threat hunting earlier. Securonics is a large SIM, um, SaaS company. Um, they are a, a Gartner uh, magic quadrant leader, and uh, they are uh, using Ahana for threat hunting. So in their case, they have these needle in a haystack queries. They're storing billions of events um, uh, every, every day, every week. And uh, uh, they, they saw much better performance moving from uh, Presto and uh, AWS to, um, uh, to Ahana. Uh, it, the stack is uh, S3 glue uh, with Presto stack. And, um, um, and, and if uh, uh, we will, I see a lot of questions, I wanna save some, uh, some time for questions and interactions, um, but um, this is you know, one of the, the use cases is very strong for Presto for, um, for either interactive or ad hoc um, querying across large amounts of, um, of data at, at quite uh, good latencies. So in summary, um, Ahana Cloud for Presto uh, is, brings ease of use, um, it is, uh, you get a nice uh, console, obviously, it's a fully managed system, better price performance, you have, we have over 200 parameters that already come tuned out of the box, um, so that you don't have to do it or understand, uh, you know, what task and currency needs to be set to, um, and it's open and flexible, uh, we are uh, open source first, we are community first, and um, you don't get locked in. You're for, you're, there is no proprietary format. We use PERK or ORC or JSON, whatever your uh, data might is in. And so it, is, uh, it give, brings, brings flexibility to you on your lake. We use the NVPC approach, um, as I mentioned. Uh, it's fully managed um, in the life cycle. You can stop, start, restart clusters. You can attach data sources, delete data sources. Um, you can query other databases um, as well. Um, and it's all cloud native, it's built to be uh, uh, highly elastic and available running on Kubernetes um, and lets you bring your own, bring your own BI tool, bring your own metadata catalog, the operational kind, which is uh, either HMS or Glue, uh, bring your own transaction manager. Um, and, and so this is how we have simplified and, and it's um, my very sincere attempt at simplifying SQL on S3, uh, as I call it, or a SQL on, on data lake. So uh, with that, um, Shannon, back to you. Let's take some questions. Dipti, thank you so much for another great presentation. And just to answer the most commonly asked questions, um, if you, uh, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday with links to the slides and the recording. So indeed you will get copies of those. And if you have questions for Dipti, feel free to put them in the Q&A portion of your screen. Although I've got some questions mixed here going in. Um, so did you just press those support XML? We have a SaaS vendor that only supports web services, which we use to pull their XML into our data lake. What types of tools or workflows have you seen with this type of situation? Yeah, yeah, so good question. Um, as I was mentioning earlier, uh, 
uh, Presto supports JSON, Parquet, Text, CSV, uh, Avro, a lot, some of the more modern formats. It does not support XML. Uh, and, and for good reason, XML is not a great, um, I've actually worked on XML databases, uh, two of them. I've worked on, I've added XML to DB2, and I've actually uh, worked on MarkLogic as well. However, the, uh, it is in this modern data lake, uh, in the column formats, that is what the engines are built for, for, uh, for columnar formats, and XML is not a great column format. So what we've seen is that uh, customers uh, transform XML using Spark uh, to uh, Parquet or ORC, and then run Presto on top uh, of that. So how does Presto querying multiple data sources differ from um, other virtualization software? Yeah, so that's a great question. So um, Presto has a pluggable architecture. Um, you know, typically I do a, a, an hour long session just on Presto itself, but at a high level, um, there is a very clean interface between the top of the, the stack of the database, which is the parser, compiler, optimizer, and execution engine, and the connectors. So because of this highly pluggable architecture, um, there are a lot of connectors that Presto has. Um, the, the primary connector, the workhorse of Presto is, called, is the Hive connector. It's again, badly named. <laughs> it should have been called the data lake connector. So it's the, it's the connector that connects to S3, HDFS, GCS and others. And that is what most, you know, 80, 90% of workloads would just go through the Hive connector. However, there are 30 other connectors. Uh, and you have, uh, for example, a MySQL connector. Let's say you have some data in MySQL uh, that's not landed in S3 yet because you're running a batch process and it takes 24 hours for it to land. And you must find some correlation in these 24 hours between something that uh, some data that's in the lake and some data that's in MySQL. Presto allows you to do that. You can run a query across these two systems, um, pull most of the data through S3, pull some data to MySQL and actually join across them and correlate and return the results back. You can do a, you know, join across our Redshift and RDS and, and S3. You can do a, 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 a join across Kafka and S3, right? It doesn't have to be S3. You can, we have customers who are doing, who don't have S3 and are federating across. Um, and so that's how it works. Um, it's called federation. Uh, the challenge with federation is that when you have a complex query, not every system is going to be able to handle it because databases are all built for a purpose, right? If you run a five-way join in a MySQL in production, it's going to fall over. So please don't do that. Run it on your replica at, at least. But think about um, uh, why you really need federation. There's certain use cases where there are good use cases, but others you uh, uh, would likely want to use just the lake itself for best performance, uh, as well as um, you know, improve stability. You know, you mentioned uh, S3 or no S3. Um, does it apply also for uh, Microsoft Azure? Yes. Yeah, so Blob Store, uh, right? Uh, so uh, any object store. So there are multiple. Um, there are multiple systems that um, essentially support the S3. Uh, protocol, right? So they're S3 compatible. Uh, On-prem, you might have MinIO as an example, right? Uh, and so Presto will connect to anything that's S3 compatible. Um, and that will, that includes, um, you know, some of the, uh, uh, some, uh, so GCS, for example, uh, Azure, um, uh, so Blob Store, uh, and other on-prem op options as well. Perfect. So a um, very important use case from um, the, this per, the, from my business users. Does Ahana or other Presto tools you recommend have IntelliSense and any support for user-defined functions? So uh, I'm not sure what IntelliSense is. Maybe uh, if you could just uh, post a, a note about is it a is it a BI tool? Um, and you know I'm, I usually know a lot about it, so I, it's the first time I'm hearing it. Uh, in terms of the second part of the question, uh, user-defined functions. Um, Yes, uh, 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 Presto actually has support for what is called function namespaces. Uh, it is, uh, it's starting to become a very popular um, feature that we are adding into Ahana as well. We are exploring, we are, we are featureizing it. 
Uh, what it allows you to do is uh, have a MySQL at the back to actually store these UDFs and be able to run these UDFs on the coordinator. Um, there is uh, going to be support for both local UDFs as well as remote UDFs. In remote UDFs, you might have uh, Hive UDFs that are running that are sitting somewhere else, and you would be able to run that as well. There's a great presentation on this um, uh, from Facebook. Uh, happy to share that with you um, as well. And they define intelligence says this auto naming of the columns and tables, like giving suggestions on column names and table names. If you I see, I see, got it. So, um, so you know, schema on the lake is um, is very different. It's a little bit different from the database, right? Uh, and the reason is that the catalogs manage the schema, right? So think of it: the S three just has objects. These objects are immutable. They're files, right? So you have, you know, parquet one, parquet two, parquet three, parquet four. The catalog, which is either Glue or Hive Metastore, actually maps this and says these files are actually a table, customer, where you have columns, name, um, phone number, state, et cetera, right? Now, you can obviously do alter table, alter table support it. Uh, in terms of um, suggestions on column names, that is a layer that sits on top of the schema. And so, you know, you could have tools, uh, there's there's other catalogs that are coming up like Amazon and, and Data Hub and others that um, gather schemas across all these different databases and as well as the lake, uh, and might give you more better suggestions on 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 these things so it is a concern if you will that's now outside the database because the the it's it's the, the deconstructed database and so that's how it would work so it's there's no direct support today uh, in presto uh, or a catalog right but maybe aws glue will add it and then presto can add it as well so do, do you see the industry using rls along with rbac we're trying to get away from rls but having but getting some pushback on that so um, in terms of um, uh, access control, right, um, on the lake, um, we are seeing, I mean, from an authentication perspective, we are seeing the, the you know, let me take a step back. Typically in, in any database, you, you would have in database capabilities, right? So in database authentication, in database uh, authorization, RBAC and all of this stuff. With the lake, what's happened is that the security concerns have been taken out of the query engine, right? And so they, they are outside. Now, Presto does obviously have support for uh, LDAP uh, integration, for example, right? For authentication and Kerberos and, um, and uh, of in, in uh, Presto authori authorization for uh, file, like your file-based authorization, multi-user authorization, stuff like that. But that's not the norm. The norm is ending up to be our back outside of um, um, outside of the system where you have roles, um, and uh, these roles get defined in systems like Ranger or on AWS Lake Formation, um, and that is where um, they get handled. So uh, Presto, for example, has a plugin uh, that Ahana wrote and we we, we open sourced it where uh, it says, hey does this user have access to this table, right? And it's gonna go and ask Ranger, does it have access? Then now there's caching and all of this stuff, but yeah, the policies will be passed from, from Ranger, the system outside to the query engine uh, to say, okay, uh, what is the authorization level for this person? And uh, does uh, he or she have access to it or not? So that's at a high level, the norm today uh, that, that we've seen. Um, very few systems kind of have mapped directly to the cloud, right? Uh, some will do work, work well with the, from a lift and shift approach, but not all of them do. Uh, Ranger has now been like shifted, if you will, to the cloud and um, and is and, and it is getting used a little bit, um, uh, increasingly, you know, being used. Uh, and then lake formation is the other uh, thing that if you're an AWS user, you might tend to just stick with that approach. 
Well, Dipti, thank you so much, as always. This is bringing us right to the top of the hour. It's been another fantastic presentation. And thanks to our uh, attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. Just love all the questions and the engagement in the chat there. I always brag about y'all, and, and you never you never let us down. It's like, it's just <laughs> well, thank you so much, uh, Shannon. Uh, pleasure, as always. Love the questions and the interaction. Um, uh, feel free to reach out to me, uh, Dipti at uh, uh, at ahana.io d-i-p-t-i at ahana.io um, always ready for a coffee chat on cloud data and open source thanks shannon thanks everyone. i love it thanks dipti thanks everybody and again i'll send you a follow-up email and i'll include that dipti's contact though in the follow-up but that'll go out by end of day thursday with links to the slides and the recording as well thanks everyone hope you all have a great day thanks dipti take care cheers bye-bye